Okay, folks. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, before I introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Barthold, there's a little bit of background about the Lindsay Lecture. Some of you may remember Russ Lindsay, Dr. Russell Lindsay down at UAB and some of the work he did down there. Uh, I can still remember when that group was very active and Dr. Gail Castle worked there and she was probably the world's expert on mycoplasma pulmonis, back when M. pulmonis was a major problem in, in rats and mice. And they, they were the experts down there and they did a lot of work in the comparative medicine. And, and about um, three or four years ago, Dr. Henry Baker, um, good, good uh, colleague of, of Russ Lindsay called and asked, is there a way that we could set up a, a tribute to Russ and all of the, all of the uh, accomplishments of him? And so we came up with the, the Lindsay Lecture and uh, we solicited funds mainly from the UAB alumni, of which there are many, but others also. And we have about $40,000 in, in an endowment that helps f f fund this lecture. So if anybody wanted to contribute, we can also do, you can also uh, do that uh, through the office at any time. And this is the third annual uh, Russ Lindsay uh, lecture. The first one was in Tucson two years ago, and it was Dr. Baker, Dr. Castle, and, and uh, Dr. Kartner that gave it. Last year it was Jim Fox out, at, out, in, Tucson, out in Lake Tahoe. And this year it's uh, Dr. Stephen Barthold. And again, this goes back uh, how long I've been around. I can remember when Steve was at Yale. Uh, he was at Yale with the, 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 the trio of, uh, of Al Jonas and, and uh, Bob Jacoby and, and, and Steve Barthold. And, and in 1978, he left there and went out to, uh, to Davis, where he's been running the mouse biology program for almost 40 years. He's uh, board certified in ACVP, and he's been a very uh, uh, strong contributor to the, our knowledge in uh, comparative medicine and comparative pathology. And I'd like to introduce uh, this year, this year's uh, Russell Lindsay speaker, Dr. Stephen Barthold. So I'm not going to give you one of my marathon lectures on pathology of laboratory animals if you've ever experienced that. <laughs> so it's weird standing up here talking about yourself for an hour. Um, so I don't know, it would have been a lot cheaper if I went to Reno instead of all the way to New Orleans, but uh, you chose Jim Fox, who's a, a dear friend and, and certainly deserving of it as well. So I'm going to kind of give you a peripatetic uh, journey through my career and how I've used laboratory animals in my research. And um, it's, I've been truly fortunate to ride the wave in the best of times and, and opportunity. And I sit around drinking beer with a friend in Davis and looking over the Central Valley and we talk about how lucky we've been. Uh, not, not to say there aren't opportunities for you now, um, but uh, I, I must say it's probably a little bit easier um, in, in those days. So how am I going to work this through the little, little tech assistance? This? All right. There we go. Okay. So. I have to admit, truly, I always wanted to be a lab animal veterinarian. And this is from my yearbook and graduating from UC Davis in 1969. It also said I had aspirations for the Army, which is not true. Uh, it, was, it was during the Vietnam era, and I had to, uh, my draft board was after me, and I signed up for the early commissioning program which fortunately allowed me to get a, a decent job assignment, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I truly did want to be a lab animal veterinarian very, very early in my career. Um, but I went off the rails a couple of times, and I'll explain why that happened. And... <laughs> it's gonna be a slow lecture. <laughs> Russ Lindsay was a good friend and colleague of mine. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'll never get it. So, here we go. Um, 
when I got, oh, I need to talk about the Army. So here I am uh, in the Army, and unfortunately I was assigned to the U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, U USARIAN. And uh, it's a good example, it's still, still in operation and a good example of, of the money being wasted in the military budget. <laughs> But the, the, whoops, the, the uh, arrow there points to the skinny guy wedged between the rather large guy on the right and Steve Fisk. I don't know if any of you know Steve, but he was my predecessor and we were assigned to, to running a small lab animal facility, which was kind of cool for you know, getting a lot of responsibility at that stage of your career. But when I finished in the Army, I uh, did my time, I came away with a life lesson that I could not take orders from stupid people. <laughs> Which meant academia was going to be the way I needed to go. So I looked around, and, I, and in those days they had the AVMA placement service, which you could list your availability for um, a job. I was looking for a lab animal medicine job, true to my interests. And um, I didn't get any response and realized I needed to go back to school. And I had applied to a program at University of Michigan directed by Ben Cohen. Um, ben was a hero in my mind in the pantheon of early lab animal medicine. Um, he was a mover and shaker, founding member of this college, um, played a big role in, in founding ALAS and ILAR and all of the the important elements of the lab animal community, and I got in. I was accepted into his program. And then I got a call from a fellow named Carl Olson at the University of Wisconsin, who was uh, equally <coughs> high in, in my esteem as a pathologist and an inaugural member of the American College of Veterinary Pathologists. And uh, he called after I um, was accepted into Ben's program, and he said, you don't want to do that. Um, we have laboratory animals at the University of Wisconsin, because I told him, but I want to become a lab animal veterinarian. He said, no, 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 you want to get a PhD, then you can be anything you want. <laughs> so this was my laboratory animal. <laughs> um, I, was, I was assigned to this project, but quite, quite rapidly became quite fascinated by the biology of, of what were called Papova viruses in those days. And this, what this slide kind of shows on the left is kind of the immunofluorescence of viral antigen in the epithelium. I don't need to tell you about that, about papillomaviruses. Um, but fibropapillomas were, were kind of cool in that you had a transformed cell population at the base of these tumors, which were fibroma cells, that were transformed <clears throat> did not have viral antigen in them. And um, kind of the, the system fit the, the, the biology of what were called Papova viruses at the time. That you had lytic infection with virus replication or you had transformation where uh, the cells were transformed, carried uh, viral DNA components, but did not have virus replication. And so the cool thing about this system um, as ugly as it, it may be, um, I could biopsy the fibromas aseptically, grow them in, in culture, and uh, study uh, the host immune response to those uh, fibroma cells. And this is a lousy histopath section taken back in the, in the early 1970s, showing infiltration of, of lymphocytes. And you have to put this into a time frame uh, a prominent immunologist down in Australia said that uh, B and T cells were equivalent to the first and last letters of the word bullshit. <laughs> and that, that's the point. Um, we in science encounter bias and dogmatism all the time. And that's, that's kind of sidetracking, but I've, I've run into that my entire career. But Obviously, I couldn't study T cells because there was very little known about them or their reagents, but I could um, look at antibody responses to the, to the fibroma cells. And there was a, a growing body of interest in, in um, 
oncogenic DNA viruses, SP40 virus, polyoma virus of mice, show papilloma virus, and, and these were collectively, as I said, called papova viruses. So I could grow these fibroma cells in culture, incubate them with serum from a calf that had undergone uh, fibroma or fibropapilloma regression and show that uh, there were little specks of fluorescent uh, reactive antigen on the surface of the tumor cells, and other people were showing this with other systems. And got, you know, I got a lot out of it. I published uh, seven papers, six first authors in, in three years. Carl had the first um, NIH training grant for veterinarians, and he was approaching retirement and told me I was ready to get out of there. And, and, uh, he, went, he wanted to fold his tent and retire. So I was one of his last graduate students. So I had married a, a young lady from the Boston area, and so I wanted to find a job in the, in the New England area at least. And so I interviewed in Boston and the University of Connecticut, and I was rejected soundly. And in fact, the University of Connecticut told me I was not qualified. Um, and then Carl called me and said, there's a job opening at Yale School of Medicine. And they finished the search, but they're willing to talk to you. So I went, I went down there. Um, I had no talk prepared or anything. They, they served me a greasy sandwich from across the street for lunch. Um, and I talked about my research. And they hired me. And I had walked in the door, and it said Division of Laboratory Animal Medicine. I said, Oh, I'm back on the rails again. Lab animals, here we go. So uh, Mel had mentioned um, the, character, the three characters on the, on the left there, Al Jonas and myself and Bob Jacoby. And the little guy in the middle is Pravin Bot. You've probably heard of him as well in the lab animal uh, infectious disease world. Um, Al was a rather um, irascible person to say, say the least, uh, I had a lot of respect for him, very, very smart man. He was a pathologist, and he told me that I would not get reappointed unless I passed my boards in pathology. Um, and by the way, this picture shows no, no lab animal clinicians in the picture. They were shorthanded and said, well, in addition to your 50% diagnostic service, um, we want you to fill in for the clinical service as well and study for your boards. And, um, my wife and I had just had a, a, a new baby and had just finished building a, a new house. And I, did, I didn't know how to de depict stress in one, one image, but this, this is a shipping crate that actually arrived with hamsters in it. Um, they were still in there, um, but they were not easy to handle, let's say. So I studied hard, I, I was a zombie for well over a year, um, when I went to take the pathology boards, my wife said, and I've said this to others, she gave me a hug and a kiss and said, good luck, don't come back unless you pass. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure all of you guys have been through that with your significant others as well. Um, I did pass, and so, the second reason why I went off the rails uh, in terms of my primary interest in lab animal medicine is when I did come home, my wife said, no more boards. <laughs> so um, I stayed as a, a pathologist. However, in 2003, you guys honored me with honorary membership in this, this organization. I truly value that. Um, it's, it really does mean a lot to me. So I sort of came in the back door, and thank you for that. <laughs> So, um, in those days, um, the evolution of immunology was occurring, et cetera. Um, we had a system uh, known as resource grants that were supported by NIH. And at that time, it was a division of research resources. It was a predecessor of, of the National Center for Research Resources. And just to kind of preach a little bit, in those days, lab animals uh, veterinarians were in positions of leadership. They, they were involved in the leadership of the NIH programs. 
Um, they were involved in this organization. They were involved in uh, the National Academies and the Institute of Lab Animal Research, and they were all synergistically interconnected. That's all broken down now for a variety of reasons, and it's, it's really too bad. But what happened in those heydays is they had these core support grants called resource grants that supported biomedical research and comparative medicine biomedical uh, research programs that provided pilot funding uh, for, for research studies or discovery, development of diagnostics, et cetera, really important stuff in those days. And they also had R01 support for veterinarians uh, studying um, new lab animal diseases. And not hypothesis-driven research necessarily, but characterization of, of new discoveries and so on. It was really great, and a lot came out of that. I think it was money well spent. But nowadays, the leadership in, in the comparative medicine program are not lab animal veterinarians. They don't have an appreciation for it. Um, and it is all atrophied away. But I'll, I'll get back on track and, and say that um, we did have uh, fun with, with diagnosing just about every imaginable disease that you'd never get to see anymore because you guys are doing your job too well, um, such as this Wesleyan University rat um, that was not performing well on a treadmill. Um, I just put that in just as a memory of, of Russ Lindsay and his, his work on mycoplasma and carbacillus as well. But one disease that, that came out of that, that was, was a spin-off of, of the, the core resource grant, was what we call transmissible murine colonic hyperplasia. And um, money was relatively easy to get from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, caused by Citrobacter rodentium, which we called Citrobacter freundii 4280 in those days. Um, and it's a cool disease, and, and it's still being used as a model system for attaching and effacing E. coli. So Citrobacter is E. coli with another name, but it attaches intimately to the mucosa, overwhelms the entire lower bowel microbiome. And uh, curiously, um, as hyperplasia ensues in response to that surface colonization. You see on the, on the mouth of the crypt on the left, the, the hyperplastic immature cells growing up onto the surface and pushing aside the infected cells. And to this day, nobody understands how that mechanism works. Why don't those newly arising cells become infected? Um, and how can they just simply push aside uh, the infected cells. But it's true, the animals would recover by this mechanism. And on the right, you can see a crypt mouth with kind of a, a wall of hy uh, retained hyperplastic cells that were still kind of immature and unwilling to exfoliate um, that, that were uninfected. Cool biology still not uh, fully understood, and, and nobody's really looking at it. Um, but in those days, in the Large Bowel Cancer Project, there were folks seeing surface labeling of uh, enterocytes, uh, and they were calling this preneoplastic, and in fact were in some cases advocating colectomies of individuals that had these kinetics. And we noticed um, that we could see surface labeling in the immature mucosa of, of these mice, but it was totally reversible, it was transient. Um, showing that in no way is that preneoplastic. So we needed to connect this somehow to large bowel cancer. So we used the carcinogen dimethylhydrazine, which produces copious numbers of uh, tumors in the, in the colon. But if we use subliminal doses, doses that did not uh, induce carcinogenesis in animals, and superimposed the colonic hyperplasia on top of that, um, we would get the development of, of these lesions that any pathologist would have called carcinoma in situ. But again, we found that when the hyperplastic stimulus went away, so did those preneoplastic lesions. It was kind of cool. Um, similar findings were, were being seen in the liver and in the skin and respiratory mucosa that hyperplasia promotes uh, the, the progression uh, events of, of neoplasia. 
But it was getting too far afield for me. I got the, the grant renewed one cycle, and I just was running out of good ideas, and I was more in fact, uh, interested in infectious disease. And so I had a back burner project on hamsters. Um, Proven Bot was fiddling around with it at the time. And there had been a couple of outbreaks of this transmissible uh, lymphoma of young hamsters, highly, highly infectious, highly contagious uh, syndrome. Lymphomas in young hamsters are extremely rare under other circumstances. And um, people were grinding up these lymphomas and trying to find an etiologic agent and, and couldn't find one. Well, with my quote, Papova virus background, I noticed that these hamsters had skin tumors. And in the skin tumors, uh, so-called trichoepitheliomas, people were calling them papillomas, whatever you wanted to call them, um, I found a uh, replicating virus. And if you look closely at the old polyomavirus literature in mice, yes, you get transformation of lots and lots of different cell types with many different types of tumor called polyomas. But mice also develop skin tumors just like this, in which you could see replicating virus. Well, um, we grew the virus out, uh, thanks to Proven Bot. Uh, we grew it in primary hamster kidney cells, uh, took purified virus, put it back into hamsters, and boom, we got lymphoma. Um, again, lymphomas without viral antigen, transformed cells. I tried like hell to publish that. Um, multiple journals rejected it, including uh, my home journal, if you will, Veterinary Pathology, that said the results were too controversial. Um, and there were some high-profile MDs who had published on this syndrome several papers uh, saying that it was a DNA viroid-like agent. And that's because they had ground up pounds of this lymphoma and extracted minuscule amounts of infectious DNA. And even though there's no such thing as a DNA viroid, um, they, they called it a DNA viroid-like agent without understanding the biology of DNA tumor viruses. But naturally, uh, journals send uh, papers out to review by experts in the field, and I just got whacked. Uh, Seriously, until finally I was able to publish it in Lab Animal Science. But um, where are we? Unresponsive prompter here. There. Whoop. Go back one, please. I'm going to use the computer. Um, <laughs> so I did not like working with hamsters in the US, so I, it's no big loss. So in, again, putting things back in perspective, when I was in my junior year in high school, Liz Kraft, a member of this college, um, described a newly, uh, a new, new age, entity in infant mice called lethal intestinal virus of infant mice. You all know that's mouse hepatitis virus by another name. But people didn't know that at the time. And um, several years later, 1969, when I graduated from veterinary school, there was a, a really good book. I, um, it's really a review of everything known about these viruses at the time. Uh, and people had, had discovered and named a whole bunch of different viruses, and they could, they could grow them out of transplantable tumors, out of tissues. Uh, they could grow them in, in a variety of cell types. They were, they were polytropic, obviously, you know, indiscriminate in terms of the cell types that they, they uh, grew in. And, and as I've taken a couple of quotes from that, some caused hepatitis, others CNS disease, and still others both. So there was kind of debates, what do you call them, mouse hepatitis virus, even though not all of them produced hepatitis, or mouse encephalitis viruses, not all of them produced encephalitis, or hepatoencephalitis viruses. And so the argument went on and on. But also, there's another quote out of that book that said, uh, the high mortality of suckling CD1 mice is caused by another virus, Livin. 
And that, that's truly what everybody believed. And, and they did not, Livum did not associate with these different uh, types of, of, of viruses. So in 19, what is it, uh, 76 or 8, um, Roger Broderson, member of this college, uh, published, I think, a landmark uh, paper uh, at, at CDC, in which they called their isolate MHVS CDC, that produced, produced livum like disease. Because livum virus was, could not be cultured, um, and it was not available for comparison, but, but surely it, it was, it was livum uh, in, in living form, so to speak. And so what that meant was I was looking for uh, funding on some other project and took advantage of National Center for Research Resources R01 funding for characterizing important lab animal diseases. And so part of that proposal just, uh, that we had for at least a couple of five-year rounds, um, we took prototype strains of mouse hepatitis virus and put them into uh, infant mice to look at patterns of infection. And we found that, that these prototype mouse hepatitis viruses had a primary tropism for respiratory epithelium and um, grew in multiple cell or organs of, of young mice, liver, brain, endothelial cells of lung, uh, type 2 pneumocytes, uh, various uh, lymph reticuloendothelial lymphoid type cells. So that all fit. You had these polytropic viruses that, that no wonder everybody could grow them in just about everything. But we had also had uh, some isolates of <coughs> enterotropic viruses, uh, thanks to Proven Bot and Abigail Smith at, at Yale, um, where we could only grow them in a mouse colon tumor cell line, CMT93, and they would not grow in the classic MHV permissive cell lines. And when we put those into infant mice, they did not disseminate to multiple organs, but rather were restricted to the intestinal epithelium, producing what Liz Kraft called balloon cells, these multinucleate syncytia uh, of the tips of villi. And so um, we worked on this for quite, quite some time, and um, Felix Homburger, now Felix Wolf, uh, worked in my lab and, and we did a lot with this system. Basically summarized, like other coronaviruses of other species, there's respiratory coronaviruses and there's enteric coronaviruses. <laughs> and there's, there's overlap between the two. So the pathogenesis of the enterotropic ones, uh, neonatal calf diarrhea, TGE of swine, uh, you name it, it's a, it's a neonatal disease, and it's related to the proliferative kinetics of the intestine, unable to keep up with the damage of the coronavirus. It was cool, really, really kind of neat. And at the time, bringing it back to Russ Lindsay, he was noticing mice that recovered from mouse hepatitis virus had what he called the clown mouse syndrome. And I thought that was kind of a cool name. And I've seen that as well in, in both naturally occurring uh, outbreaks as well as experimental mice. But along came Lyme disease. And there's a, this was in the early 1980s, and uh, a, a physician at, at Yale, uh, Alan Steer, uh, was kind of assigned this troubling uh, epidemic, if you will, a cluster of, of children in Lyme, Connecticut, that had uh, what <coughs> physicians were calling rheumatoid, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which it was not, obviously. And it was associated with the presence of this new tick in the area, Ixodes gamini, as it was called at the time, but it's now Ixodes scapularis. And a fellow at the Rocky Mountain Labs took those ticks, and uh, he was working on relapsing fever Borrelia, so he had media for it, um, and, and grew out of the ticks Borrelia burgdorferi, named after Willie Burgdorfer at the Rocky Mountain Labs. And so we know, now know the whole story of this complex two-year life cycle involving paramiscus mice and on the west coast squirrels. Deer is an uh, uh, important host for the adult stage of the tick, etc. And it's no longer called Lyme arthritis but Lyme disease because it's so protean and it's many, many manifestations. But what was curious in, in 
before people knew what was going on in studying these cases, is that the erythema migrans, as you see on the left, and the arthritis were ephemeral. They spontaneously regressed without treatment. But obviously, uh, people did get treatment, and what treatment did was accelerate the resolution of, of those symptoms. So Alan Steer came to me and said, um, I have buckets of NIH money. We need to develop an animal model. And I said, I'm not interested in this disease. I'm happy with mouse hepatitis virus. <laughs> and and he, he says, well, can't you just help me? Uh, we can do some pilot studies. So, OK. Other people had been unable to even infect laboratory animals with uh, the isolate of Borrelia burgdorferi that was going around from lab to lab. We reasoned that, well, the passage of bacteria, many times you lose the infectivity. And so we went out and, and dragged the woods for new ticks, uh, had several new isolates of Borrelia, and um, picked out the ones that grew best in culture that could be uh, easily manipulated in the lab, put them into Lewis rats, which are, which are susceptible to bacterial cell wall-induced arthritis, figure that would stack the decks in our favor, and boom, the rats developed arthritis. And so Alan Steer says, we've got to submit an R01 application on this. And I said, no, I don't want to work on this. <laughs> and he says, just, you know, let's, let's, just, let's just try. So we put it in. It got funded. And one of the specific aims was, we don't want to work with rats. We want to work with mice. And so we put it into a variety of different inbred strains of mice. And some of the mice. Uh, didn't develop much arthritis, and others were quite susceptible to arthritis, but all of them got infected. So you had uh, susceptible host, you had disease-resistant, disease-susceptible animals, lots of fodder for, for lots of fun science. And so I was stuck with this R01. Alan Steer went to Tufts University, leaving me high and dry <laughs> as the guy that had to do this R01. So I gave my MHV grant over to Sue Compton at, at Yale, and uh, she carried it forward from there. So in those days, it's the beginning of molecular biology, if you will. Um, this is an auger gel electrophoresis of several of the isolates of Borrelia burgdorferi that we grew in culture, um, ran the protein down the auger gel, and in that red rectangle there is a very prominent protein that was called outer surface protein A. Beginning of the alphabet, there was outer surface protein A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. Um, but OSP A, as it was called, made up 30% of the total mass of the spirochete. So we said, well, let's make a vaccine. And so a guy at, at, at Yale, uh, Fred Cantor, who was an MD immunologist, had a technician in his lab that developed Lyme disease. And so he said, well, I, I wanna, I'm interested in, in making a vaccine. And he went into the literature to see if there was any animal model to study. And he said, oh, this Barth old guy. Um, oh, he's at Yale. So he came down to my office, we talked, and we met up with a new fellow, the head of immunobiology at Yale, uh, Richard Flavel, who was kind of the the new up-and-coming molecular biology wizard. Um, and we decided we'd make an outer surface protein A vaccine. And boom, it was successful. It protected mice against ticks. Born challenge, it protected mice against syringe born challenge. And in eight short years, it had gone through phase one, two, and three clinical trials and was on the market. And then the lawyers got after it. Uh, class suit against it, Smith, Klein, and Beach, and said, to hell with this. They pulled it off the market, and that was the end of my fortune with Lyme disease vaccine. <laughs> so it's going forward in Europe. Uh, it's an effective vaccine in, in dogs. Uh, the horse industry is using it surreptitiously. Um, it is protective, um, but uh, people claim that it has side effects, and I won't get into that argument one way or the other. I'm not interested in vaccine development. I'm interested in biology. And what I did notice is if we looked at various immunoglobulin responses of, of mice um, infected for up to a full year, they didn't seroconvert to this highly pro prominent protein that you saw in culture. 
That was weird. We know it's immunogenic. It stimulates a protective immune response, but it's not expressed or it's not recognized by the host immune system. Um, and in, in science, the fun part is, is following those leads. And so what it led to was OSPE <clears throat> is important for Borrelia inside of the tick. So if you look at the upper left panel um, and you label the mid-gut of an unfed tick, so-called flat tick, you can label spirochetes. And you could label those spirochetes in the right upper panel um, with anti-OSP-A antibody. So OSP-A was being expressed in the tick. But once the tick started feeding, the spirochetes left the mid-gut, migrated to the salivary glands, lower left-hand corner. You could see the spirochetes with anti-Borrelia antibody but they were no longer expressing outer surface protein A. And so the spirochetes shift. Um, they, they lose outer surface protein A um, as they enter the host, and it's no, uh, no longer immunologically visible to the host. So it's a vulnerable antigen that's important in the biology inside of the tick, but it's deleterious to the spirochete if it gets into the host. And so Mother Nature has found a way for it to, to do that. And others have found now that uh, there are other antigens that are upregulated uh, during in early infection, others that are upregulated during the course of persistent infection. So the OSPE vaccine, why the heck did it work? Um, it worked because it killed the spirochetes in the mid-gut of the feeding tick. So the, once the tick started feeding, the serum antibody in, in that very early blood meal would kill the spirochetes before they could migrate to the salivary glands and therefore never get into the host. That was kind of cool biology. But I was interested in, in this thing of, of the ephemeral nature of the arthritis so that you infect a, a susceptible mouse, they developed arthritis and then underwent spontaneous resolution of the arthritis. And if you looked in its tissues, uh, three months, four months, it didn't have arthritis, but yet it was persistently infected. So Borrelia found a way of evading host immune clearance um, and had a way of stimulating the elimination of, of any uh, deleterious effects of the infection. And so we could take serum from a mouse that had undergone the arthritis, transfer it into an infected skid mouse with florid arthritis and cause complete resolution of its disease. And so that skid mouse would look just like an immunocompetent animal and how it dealt with Borrelia burgdorferi. And in those days, uh, the congenic mouse was coming along, and this was later on in the 80s, I believe. Um, so we, we took a, a cluster of congenic B6 mice. B6 mice are disease resistant, but are susceptible to infection. And found that those animals that were B cell deficient could not elicit a protective antibody response against challenge infection and could not elicit disease resolution when passively transferred into the skid mouse system. They could have T cells, uh, et cetera, uh, or, or not T cells, and, and it had no effect whatsoever, indicating that the important antibody responses to Borrelia were B cell mediated and T cell independent. And the other thing about Borrelia is persistence. It persists in 100% of the animals that are infected uh, with Borrelia, either by tick or by syringe. Who, who cares? A number of other people in other laboratories have shown, shown that uh, dogs, uh, gerbils, paramiscus mice, laboratory mice, macaques, baboons, hamsters, guinea pigs, rats, all are persistently infected. It is the rule uh, rather than the norm. So there's no bell-shaped curve involved in this. It occurs all of the time. And if we look at the antibody response of animals that are infected for a full 12 months of infection, they have a peculiar antibody response in terms of titering out the protective activity using serial dilutions of, of serum and then doing a passive transfer uh, protective assay. It peaks early during the infection when disease is resolving as well, 
and declines, as if the spirochete has disappeared from the host, and yet it's still there. And Borrelia is, is really a fascinating organism. I, you know, I didn't think I'd be interested in it, but I got totally hooked. And once it gets into the skin from the vector, it goes hell-bent for leather to the lymph nodes. Why would a pathogen do that? It stimulates an early uh, and aberrant immune response that's, that's T cell independent, extra follicular, um, far more complex than I can understand, but fortunately a, a veterinary immunologist is working on it uh, in our center since I retired. But that antibody response benefits the host by resolving disease, and so that makes sense. You know, paramiscus mice scurry around for a couple of years in life carrying the organism waiting for a tick to feed upon them, and that's how they survive that complex two-year cycle. But it also benefits Borrelia. It doesn't ha do harm to the host, and it allows persistence of the organism and, and evades immune clearance in all of its hosts. So if we do the Western blot, again using cultured organisms as antigen because there's no other way to get an antigen, we uh, looked at this antibody response very early at two weeks of infection where uh, mice had or their serum had protective activity and disease resolving activity. And we noticed that the, the serum antibody response was directed at a small number of antigens, none of which were the ones that induced protective or disease-resolving uh, antibody responses. We made recombinant proteins of those and immunized mice. No, no biologic activity to speak of, with the exception of a little bit of OSPC protection. So that cued us in to the fact that, well, you know, we know that OSPC story with ticks, and there must be something going on in the host with upregulation of antigens that we're not seeing in cultured organisms. And so we used a genomic expression library where you basically ch chop up the Borrelia genome, put it into random pieces, take random pieces, put it into E. coli, and then uh, stimulate those E. coli uh, in culture and um, label them with antibody in a blind way with serum from infected mice. And lo and behold, um, we came up with a, a plethora of, of new antigens that were being so-called in vivo expressed. And the majority of, the majority of them were recognizing components of the extracellular matrix. And um, fibronectin, uh, laminin, integrins, et cetera, decorin is, uh, decorates collagen throughout the body, et cetera telling us that Borrelia has a very strong tropism for connective tissue, and those are the secrets to its biology. And so one of those proteins, known as decorin binding protein, we made in recombinant form, immunized mice, took the serum from those immunized mice, transferred them into skid mice, and we could protect the mice against challenge infection, and we could cause resolution of disease. And furthermore, decorin binding protein um, is a T independent antigen. In other words, uh, T cell or, or B cell uh, deficient animals, T cell deficient animals developed an adequate antibody response and, and behaved properly with this antigen. So it all comes home to biology, which is the cool thing about us being veterinarians, is we're always thinking big picture down to the little picture. And uh, I can't think of a better discipline for science than, than that. Um, and if we go back to the mouse and we look at its tissues during persistent infection, where is it? It's in the superficial skin. Why is it there? That's the interface with the vector. And furthermore, from the very beginning, we knew that Borrelia didn't grow at core body temperature. It only did well at, at the peripheral skin sites. And so that little mouse on the, on the right-hand corner is showing fluorescent spirochetes and, and where they home into. And the back is shaved and shows no fluorescence going on there. And notably, ticks like to attach around the, the, the muzzle and the eyes and the ears. And again, it, it fits with biology. So my research was getting me 
closer and closer into trouble with the medical establishment. <laughs> At the time, I think it was 2006, um, the Infectious Disease Society of America said, Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria. You can treat it with a short-term course of antibiotics. Patients get better. Um, boom, boom, you're done. Patient comes back, I have chronic symptoms. And they say, well, you don't have Lyme disease anymore. You've got adequate treatment. Um, you have post-Lyme disease syndrome. And at the time, we were finding uh, persistence of, of organisms after antibiotic treatment. So we would treat mice with antibiotics at different stages of infection and look in their tissues with, with TACMAN PCR, quantitative PCR, and find persistence of DNA in their tissues. At the time, it was only DNA. And in the IDSA report, which they asked me to review, I said, be careful not to overstate the fact that, that there is a persistence after treatment. They ignored that. Um, and they said, it's just DNA debris. Well, foreign DNA does not hang around in the body. Um, we have innate alarm signals that, that clear it very rapidly. And, and others have shown that if you put Borrelia DNA in the host, as well as our own lab, it gets cleared very rapidly. So something was going on, and other bacteria um, require long-term antibiotic treatment. Um, they're not cleared readily by the immune system, particularly bacteria that are prone to persistent infection and capable of evading host immune responses, whether it be Q fever or tuberculosis or whatever. But the medical community refused to accept that was a problem with Borrelia. So antibiotics 101 um, is that antibiotics are not sterilants. We certainly know that with AIDS patients you can treat uh, with antibiotics, you can knock down uh, the bacterial burdens, but they won't be eliminated. Um, and the effectiveness uh, depends upon the host mopping up the remainder in the of the infection. And in fact, the I IDSA people said that. Well, Borrelia persists in its immunocompetent hosts. And so it only makes sense if the host can't eliminate completely Borrelia burgdorferi, particularly in the chronic infection, it's not going to be able to mop up remaining bacteria. And so using the mouse model, I got myself into really deep water um, by, sh by showing using TACMAN PCR the presence of persisting DNA. And if you stop the experiment at six months or four months, you'd say, well, those animals are cured. Um, but if you waited 12 months, there was a resurgence of the DNA in tissues to the level that you saw in non-antibiotic treated persistently infected mice. So the spirochetes were coming back up to the same level as a chronically infected animal without treatment. But we couldn't culture Borrelia. There was something different about these. And so now that we haven't figured that out and I'm retired and it's left for somebody else to do. But what we found is we could feed ticks upon these animals, and the ticks would acquire um, forms of organisms. I won't say it, they're spirochetes, but you could label them in the midgut of the ticks with anti-Borrelia specific antibody. Um, if you want to call this uh, DNA debris, feel free. <laughs> we looked in the tissues of these treated animals, and we saw morphologically equivalent DNA debris that labeled with <laughs> specific antibody to Borrelia burgdorferi. Furthermore, uh, we found, and this is rather complicated, but it basically shows there's RNA transcription of a whole bunch of different Borrelia genes. We're looking at very minuscule amounts of DNA debris that's doing this, um, but DNA does not transcribe RNA by itself. Again, suggesting that these organisms are live. And if we look at, at 12 months of infection um, and compare uh, the cytokine levels of hosts uh, compared to uh, age-matched, uninfected uh, control animals, we see in the, on the left the uh, saline-treated animals that are infected 
and on the right, the antibiotic-treated infected animals. So there's pro-inflammatory noise going on, on these in these tissues with DNA debris. So a number of other laboratories um, throughout the world, uh, my colleagues at Yale and myself, um, a, an investigator in, in Sweden, uh, Cornell University, a veterinarian Straubmager, uh, showed this in dogs, and Monica Embers um, at, at Tulane with, with uh, macaques, all show persistence of DNA after antibiotic treatment, regardless of what the antibiotic is. Doxycycline all the way down to tigacycline. And um, we collaborated with the, uh, Monica Embers on the monkey work, and they didn't believe us for a couple of years. And then finally, as evidence started accruing, they, they got brave and, and published their, their findings. But all of these studies have shown that Yes, you have persistence of DNA that's acting like Borrelia burgdorferi, that's looking at like Borrelia burgdorferi, and it, but it can't be cultured. There's something going on. It's slow growing. It's, it's not robust. And we know that if you take a tick from the wild, you can't culture all Borrelia isolates out of that tick. Only some will grow in media. So uh, that doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't mean that if you had the right medium, you couldn't culture them. But our studies selectively have, have shown these factors of, of uh, labeling spirochetes in ticks that are fed upon animals. We can transplant tissues from treated animals into naive skid mice and, and the, the DNA will disseminate to target organs um, and so on and so forth. So slowly but surely, uh, the medical community uh, is recognizing this, but they, um, there's, there's tremendous bias against any research on persistence of Borrelia burgdorferi, um, either the biology of persistence per se or persistence after treatment. Um, people have been burned. Uh, there's what's called the Lyme Wars going on between the lay community and the medical community, between the medical community and the scientific community. It's a very touchy uh, subject area. And, I figured just before I retired, I would throw in one Hail Mary grant application to, to look at this. And it was the only NIH grant that I ever submitted that got outright rejected. Um, and so this speaks for private foundation money um, that is beginning to open doors on, on this phenomenon. It's important work and hopefully um, NIH will, will open its eyes as well. And all of this speaks to the power of comparative medicine. <laughs> it's, it's been a great ride. Uh, when I was at a National Academies meeting with, with Lyme disease, somebody in the audience says, why can't more veterinarians be studying this problem because the medical community isn't doing it right? Um, and it's so true. We have such a wonderful background to look at biology in the, in the whole context, the whole ecosystem and down to the whole animal, down to tissues, down to molecules. So any of you young folks that are aspiring to uh, do research, I'm not saying it's for everyone, it's painful sometimes, um, it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great career. You don't have to take orders from stupid people if you have your own funding. And you meet some great people. And so that brings me back to pathology. Um, and you meet people like Dean Percy, uh, where he was my predecessor at Yale as a pathologist. Um, he brought his students down to Yale to share with our archives of lab animal pathology, and he, he talked me into co-authoring the first edition of, of pathology of laboratory rodents and rabbits that young people were calling the gray book. The next edition was the green book, and then the blue book, and then the maroon book or something like that. So, Name, we didn't allow the name to stick. So at any rate, thank you very much for listening to my story. And uh, next time I'll talk about pathology of laboratory animals. So. <laughs>
If not, I have one quick story, then I have something for Dr. Barthold. Um, this is about Al Jonas and Dr. Jonas. This is in, um, and, and some of you don't remember this and you're too young. Uh, PowerPoints, and all, the only thing you've ever seen, you've never seen 35 millimeter slides, Kodachrome slides. Everybody would bring them to a meeting and they were your life. You put them in carousels and they went around and around and they projected them. ACLAM had a, 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 a one day retreat at an, at an Indiana, Indianapolis. It was after, uh, it was at an ALAS meeting and we went off into a state park and it was a continu continuing education retreat. And, and uh, we knew it was gonna be a short meeting because there was no alcohol allowed in the park. <laughs> Except people got around it with the trunks of their cars. Anyhow, Al Jonas was one of the, the keynote speakers going to give a two hour talk on, on laboratory animal pathologists. And I think as all of us as lab animal medicine veterinarians love to see pathologists talk and it all makes sense when you see the slides and they point it out. When you look at the slides and they're not there pointed out, not so much. I see Al before the, before the meeting and he's looking sick. And I said, Al, you all right? And he said, no. I said, are you sick? He said, no, worse. I said, what's worse? I forgot my slides. <laughs> they're, back, they're back in New England. I said, that's worse. <laughs> this is not the day when somebody could email him a PowerPoint presentation, they can just do it. He went through a two hour talk describing pathology with no slides. <laughs> We all use our imagination, and that's why we didn't do well on the past section on, on the boards. Uh, for some of you who may know, Al went on to become the first dean of the vet school at Tufts, uh, and then eventually to, to, but to um, uh, Jackson Labs. But uh, I just want you to, to, to tell that story. I think you may have a question for Dr. Barthold. Steve, I come back up. Steve, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was wondering, could you pontificate a little bit about say, variability in this persistence, and maybe that's what there's problem in detection with uh, the bond with the immune system and the variability of the expression of the, of the uh, spirochetes. So is there variability, and that's why it takes a while for it to come back after treatment, and then it seems to have symptoms in the human patients where it comes and goes, um, the, at least the symptomatology does. Um, I'm not sure I quite follow, uh, but people have found a, a variable uh, a VLSE sequence in the genome of Borrelia that's kind of like relapsing fever Borrelia that the um, scientific community is widely accepted as the mechanism by which Borrelia can persist. I don't believe it. Um, I think that the VL VLSE system for Borrelia burgdorferi is more attuned to its shown uh, tropism for connective tissue elements, and so it enhances uh, Borrelia's ability to get into uh, connective tissue. I believe what Borrelia is doing is sequestering uh, within collagen. Um, the antibody response is weird. It's IgM dominant, which can't get out of vasculature in the absence of inflammation. Um, there's probably a whole host of different explanations for how it can so effectively persist. Um, but you can pretty much go to the right tissues and the right sites and see where they are persisting. They're, they're dependable. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't anybody capable of doing that anymore. Um, nobody's studying it in the way that they should be. Um, if you take away Decorin, you take a Decorin knockout mouse, Borrelia can't persist. And so the immune response can hit them um, if they are, so somehow Decorin is, is binding, Decorin binding protein, somehow that's making them a cult to the immune system. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But that, that curve of, of early biologically relevant antibody that declines over the course of persistent infection may also explain the fact that Borrelia will cause periodic relapses over the course of several months. And each relapse is a little bit less severe over multiple relapses, and that's been shown in humans. Um, so I, I sort of think that that might be behind that. There's no immunologic memory to this T-independent immune response that's going on. I, did that kind of get at what you're up to? Okay. Is that it? <laughs>
Well, Al Jonas always told me to carry my slides, so I guess that's how he... Uh... <laughs> well, you stay right here. I got one, one last order of business right here. And uh, we have a plaque for Steve in recognition for his uh, giving this uh, third a lecture. Um, and and uh, we appreciate his expertise and his spending his time with us, and this is for you. Not to hog the microscope, but I was wondering if you guys could do me the favor of sending this to me because I came here on a basic economy airfare. <laughs> and I, my luggage is restricted to 17 by 10 by 9 inches. And I'm, I'm at, I'm at the, the max of that, and there's no way I can get this in there. Okay, thanks. All right, I just want to say a big thank you to our speakers this morning. We really appreciate it. So right now we're going to have lunch until 1 o'clock at the Fleur de Lis um, lunch area and playhouse. So please come back at 1 o'clock for the second half of our program. Thank you.